بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ثم ما بعد to proceed uh, today إن شاء الله we will have two chapters um, the first one is باب تعارض تعارض الدعاوى which is the chapter on conflicting claims and the second is باب حكم كتاب القاضي or the chapter on correspondence of judges um, We are on track, alhamdulillah, to finish uh, in three weeks. So we will have three more weeks, inshallah, uh, to finish the entire sort of book of Al-Umda, uh, Hanbali Primer according to the, or Afaq Primer according to the Hanbali Mazha. Uh, well, let's start by Bab Ta'arud al-Da'awa, Al-Imam ibn Qudama, who died in the year 620, after the Hijra, I said in his book, Umdat al-Fiqh, uh, under the uh, book of al-Qada, or judiciary, uh, under the chapter of uh, conflicting claims, or Babu Ta'arud al-Da'awa, he said, إِذَا تَنَازَعَ قَمِيصًا أَحَدُهُمَا لَابِسُهُ وَالْآخَرُ آخِذٌ بِكُمِّهِ فَهُوَ لِلَابِسِهِ if they dispute over a shirt while one of them is wearing it and the other is holding its sleeve, it will be for the one who's wearing it. It will be for the one who's wearing it. You may think it's a little bit trivial, like, you know, why do we, you know, this is a primer. Um, this is a, a manual. So why do we have to include sort of uh, trivial disputes of this nature? Uh, the purpose of including a sort of a trivial uh, dispute of this nature is that it gives you, it's a prototype. It is telling you that we act on what is called the zahir, what's apparent, uh, that, is, that can be also called qarina, corroborative evidence, which is short of bayina which is the admissible evidence. Admissible evidence in Islamic judiciary is called the bayina, which means clear, clear cut. So the clear cut evidence is the bayina, and we spoke last time about the bayinat, and we will go back and put everything together at the end of this session, inshallah, when it comes to acknowledgement, iqrar, bayina, which is the clear proof, uh, the uh, basically al zahir which is the qarina, which is the corroborative evidence, al nukul an al yamin refusal to take an oath, al qur'a which is uh, drawn lots, and uh, al yamin which is uh, taking an oath. All of these are methods by which we uh, try to ascertain um, justice in uh, disputation. And we will talk about the order um, according to the different mazah, primarily, of course, according to the Hanbali uh, madhab. Uh, but what this uh, uh, is mainly about, this chapter is mainly about, after he spoke, la after we spoke last time about al bayinat which are the clear proofs, and uh, favoring one bayina over the other, which we will come back today, after he spoke about this last time, he's talking here about a zawahir, which are sort of apparent hints, indications, corroborative proofs or evidences on uh, the entitlement of one over the other. The entitlement of one over the other. So here, if someone is wearing a shirt and someone is holding to uh, the sleeve of the shirt, uh, then we will give it to the one who's wearing the shirt uh, because, you know, obviously it is, it's clear that he was wearing the shirt and this person wants to take it off of him. Then, in Tanaza Adab, Haduhuma Rakibuha, Awlahu Alayha Himlun Fahiyalahu. If they dispute over a beast of burden while one of them is riding it or has his belongings on it, it will be his. It will be his, the person who's riding. So you, you're, you know, uh, you have an indication here 
that this probably belongs to that. Keep in mind, when, when, why are we doing this? Uh, because this is important also to remember. Why are we doing this? Because we don't have a bayina. We don't have a proof. We are only resorting to this because we didn't have a proof. Last chapter was about the proofs and, you know, um, uh, favoring one proof over the other and so on and so forth. Uh, which we said in the Hanbali Madhab, uh, admissible proofs are treated as all equal. But uh, here he keeps on telling us about these corroborative evidences, hints, indications uh, to the entitlement of one over the other. He gives us another example. وَإِن تَنَازَعَ أَرْضًا فِيهَا شَجَرْ أَوْ بِنَاءَ أَوْ زَرَعْ لِأَحَدِهِمَا فَهِيَ لَهُ If they dispute over a piece of land that has trees, buildings, or crops belonging to one of them, it will be his. People know that this person used to harvest the crops or used to pick the fruits off these trees for the last so many years and people know that he owns those trees but they don't know who owns the land who owns the land because that could be possible you know uh, they don't know who owns the land could be it is possible to be someone else and in this case if no one of them has proof of ownership then they will give it to the person who was uh, basically picking the fruits or the harvesting the crops وَإِن تَنَازَعَ صَانِعًا فِي قُمَاشِ دُكَّان فَآلَةُ كُلِّ صَنَاعَةٍ لِصَاحِبِهَا If two craftsmen dispute over tools in a store, the tools of each craft will be for the one who practices it. Because two people can come together, one is a tailor, one is an embroiderer, and they come together and establish a business. Now, they are uh, breaking up and sort of having, um, uh, terminating the, the partnership. We will have to figure out which uh, tools belong to whom. And in this case, if they don't have proofs, then whatever is used for embroidery will be for the embroider. Whatever is used for tailoring will be for the tailor. That's it. That's how we figure this out. And then he says, وَإِن تَنَازَعَ الزَّوْجَانِ فِي قُمَاشِ الْبَيْتِ فَلِلْرَّجُلْ مَا يَصْلُحُ لِلْرِّجَالِ وَلِلْمَرْأَةِ مَا يَصْلُحُ لِلْنِسَاءِ وَمَا يَصْلُحُ لَهُمَا فَهُوَ بَيْنَهُمَا If two spouses dispute over the furniture and, ha and houseware, uh, the husband will be entitled to that which is more suitable for men, uh, acts, for instance, uh, and the wife uh, to that which is more suitable for women. They would say like uh, uh, needles, uh, sewing machine, no. Stop. And what is suitable for both will be divided between them. What is suitable for both will be divided between them. Then he moves on uh, and says, وَإِن تَنَازَعَ حَائِطًا مَعْقُودًا بِبِنَائِهِمَا أَوْ مَحْلُولًا مِنْهُمَا فَهُوَ بَيْنَهُمَا وَإِن كَانَ مَعْقُودًا بِبِنَائِ أَحَدِهِمَا وَحْدَهُ فَهُوَ لَهُ If they dispute over a wall that is attached to both of their buildings or that is not attached to either one, it will be for them both, split it. If it is attached to the building of one of them alone, then it is his. <clears throat> so here is the wall. And sometimes, the, you know, in order to keep the wall standing, they, it will be, there will be sort of what? Uh, hmm? Huh? Beams? Beams? No, no ropes to, like, yeah, ropes to hold it. Uh, and if the ropes are holding it to, the, to my side, then it is my wall. If the ropes are like attaching it to the other side, then if you place a beam, like a wood lug, on the wall, that does not give you the right to claim it. Uh, 
you're doing it for your benefit. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade neighbors from preventing their neighbors. If the wall is yours, you're forbidden from preventing your neighbor to lay his beam on your wall if he needs it for you know, uh, his structure. You know, to place the wood lugs. There is a wall between me and you, and you want to place a wood lug on the wall uh, to hang something, for instance. Uh, then the neighbor should not prevent his neighbor from that. So that would not be a proof that you know placing a wood lug on the wall. That's not a proof. But if the wall is attached through ropes to uh, one side, uh, then uh, then it's, it is an indication that the owner of that side to which the ropes are attached is the owner of the wall. Okay, then he says, وَإِن تَنَازَعَ صَاحِبُ الْعُلُوُّ وَالسُّفْلِ فِي السَّقْفِ الَّذِي بَيْنَهُمَا أَوْ تَنَازَعَ صَاحِبُ الْأَرْضِ وَالنَّهْرِ فِي الْحَائِطِ الَّذِي بَيْنَهُمَا أَوْ تَنَازَعَ قَمِيصًا أَحَدُهُمَا أَخِذٌ بِكُمِّهِ وَبَقِيهِ مَعَ الْآخَرِ فَهُوَ بَيْنَهُمَا Likewise, okay, he says, uh, if the owners of the upper and lower floors in a building dispute over the ceiling between them, it will be for both of them. Likewise, if the owners of a piece of land and a water stream dispute over the fence between them, it will be for both of them. Finally, if two people dispute over a shirt while one of them is holding its sleeve, but the other person has the rest of it, it will be for both of them. Keep in mind, he's not wearing it. He's just, one is holding the sleeve, and the other one is holding the rest of it. He could have overpowered him easily and held more of the, of the shirt. Uh, so that would not be an indication that he owns it. They're both holding this, the, the, the garment. So if you're holding like a smaller piece of the garment, it is not going to give an advantage to the one who's holding a bigger piece of the garment. They're saying if you are, for instance, <clears throat> If this uh, uh, ceiling, uh, this is the one in the lo on the lower level, the one on the upper level, this ceiling is between us. Uh, if we don't have proof, then the ceiling belongs to uh, who? Both. Okay, so if, this, if it extends out like this, and the person on the lower level does not own this land, it belongs to whom? The one on the upper level. Uh, the one on the upper level. Now, if you have stairway that is going to the upper level, it belongs to whom? The upper level. If the stairway is going to the, uh, that is given the, okay. If the stairway, if there is a common, a common uh, lobby, and the stairway is going to the upper level from the common lobby. The stairway belongs to whom? Both. Huh? Both. Okay. Uh, okay. So let us say, you know, it, it, there is a, a, a front yard here. The stairway, and we're not saying a common lobby. We're saying a front yard. And the stairway is going to the upper level from the front yard. If the stairway is going to it, so so the stairway is starting here. From here to here, you know, you're coming in from here, and you would walk all the way to the stairway. This area is between them. It is it belongs to both of them. The area below the stairway. If it has anything for the person on the lower level, it belongs to them. Because that area, the, the person on the upper level does not need that area. He just needs to get to the stairway. We will give him you know, part of the entrance to the stairway, uh, to get to the stairway. Uh, but since this is a front yard, a common front yard, then it will be between them, the person on the lower level and the person on the uh, upper level. Okay, and this is 
like a stream of water, and this is land. This land belongs to A. The stream of water belongs to B. And there is a fence here, a wall here, between the stream of water and the land. This fence is going to be between them. Uh, you know, all of this is when no one is able to produce proof that it belongs to them. Okay. Now, we will come to, uh, if a Muslim and an unbeliever dispute over a deceased person, each one claiming that the, the person died on his faith, we will come to this. But before we come to this, let me tell you that this is clearly proving that we did include in the Islamic judiciary, because if you look at the theory, if you look at the fuqaha theorizing, the fuqaha are saying that we don't employ qara'in. The, the prevalent view in the, these chapters is that we don't employ qara'in in uh, the Islamic judiciary. That is what qara'in would be what in our times? Would be basically all forensic science. We don't employ qara'in. We have to have a bayina, and the bayina the fuqaha, the majority of the fuqaha said the bayina has to be mawquf, has to be traceable to the Prophet ﷺ, has to be proven by the revelation what is admissible evidence and what is not admissible evidence. They had the luxury to say that because the word has not changed, you know, for maybe 1,000, 1,100 years after the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, to, uh, to basically require any uh, sort of uh, reconsideration of this. Do the bayinat have to be truly, uh, do the bayinat have to be truly traceable to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Well, maybe you would say yes, if it is bayina, clear cut proof, needs to be traceable to the Prophet ﷺ. But are we going to only rely on bayinat in the Islamic judiciary? Will we do away with forensic science nowadays? DNA testing, fingerprints, and all of that stuff. And certainly some of you will be able to cite some anecdotes where forensic medicine got it all wrong. And you will be able to send me video clips of you know, people talking about how forensic medicine sometimes, forensic science, sometimes gets it all wrong. These are anecdotes, and uh, they should not be, they should not defy the facts that forensic science is extremely needed for the establishment of justice, and uh, judiciaries across the world rely on forensic science for establishing justice, and that is the ultimate goal. Yes, you could say that in Islam we want to be careful. In Islam we want to be cautious. Uh, you want to have results randomized, the results coming from two different labs, uh, results this or that. You could always say that. But to say we will do away with forensic science because one time, uh, fingerprints turned out to be wrong, or one time, you know, DNA testing turned out to be wrong. That does not make sense. You are driven by your uh, dogmatism. Uh, like you want to prove that the fuqaha that you love were right about excluding corroborative end evidence that would be called tangible evidence, that would be called physical evidence that is called basically um, forensic science in our times, forensic investigations, forensic medicine, etc., etc. You want to prove your beloved fuqaha right, so you're looking for confirmation. And you will search YouTube for lots of uh, video clips uh, to prove your point, but you will ignore the 99%, and that is the nature of people who are dogmatic. Uh, they will always sort of cling to the 1% to 
to prove their theory right and ignore the 99%. So anyway, what you can say is that in Islam, we have to be careful. When we use corroborative evidence, when we use tangible evidence, uh, physical evidence, we need to be careful. But at the same time, our bayinat always, at the same time, our bayinat always 100% certain. What are bayinat? What is a bayina? Okay, four witnesses in certain cases, right? That is sexual crimes, uh, zina. Uh, two witnesses in most cases. Two witnesses in most other cases. One witness plus your oath according to the majority in financial cases, okay? That's a bayina. Refusal to take an oath. Refusal to take an oath. Okay, four witnesses, just, you know. Uh, that is, you know, uh, uh, sort of nor, you know, it is obvious for Zena. Two witnesses, that's the standard. Shahidaini min rajalikum, fa illam yakuna rajulayn, farajulun wa mra'atan. One witness, well, one male witness, two female witnesses, that is also in what? Financial. So financial, two witnesses, male witnesses, one male witness, two female witnesses, one witness plus the oath, because Qadr Rasulullah Sallam bishahidi wa yameen, and this was reported by Muslim, and reported by Nasa'i, and reported by others. So the majority, aside from the Hanafis, the majority would uh, judge on the basis of one witness plus your oath. You bring in with you one witness, take an oath, that's a bayina. That's clear proof. Uh, refusal to take an oath, well, which we said this would be on, on whom? The defendant um, is the one who will basically uh, be asked to uh, take an oath, and if he refuses to take an oath, then we will judge against him uh, for refusal to take an oath. Okay. Are these certain, 100% certain? No, they are not. So if you, if you are talking about forensic me in, in science not being 100% certain, is one witness and, and your oath 100% certain? Well, absolutely not. Therefore, you know, preponderance, like, you know, uh, uh, al are usually based on dhan al-ghalib at the end of the day. That is why the Prophet Sallallahu said, you know, إِنَّكُمْ تَخْتَصِمُونَ إِلَيَّ وَلَعَلَّ بَعْضَكُمْ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَلْحَنَ بِحُجَّتِهِ مِنْ بَعْضٍ فَأَقْضِي لَهُ عَلَى نَحْوٍ مِمَّا أَسْمَعُ فَمَنْ قَضَيْتُ لَهُ أَوْ فَمَنْ اقْتَطَعْتُ لَهُ شَيْئًا مِنْ حَقِّ أَخِي فَإِنَّمَا أَقْتَطِعُ لَهُ جَمْرَةً مِنَ النَّارِ فَلْيَأْخُذْ أَوْ يَدَعْ So you bring your disputes to me. And I'm a human being. I'm a human being. So I may judge in favor of the one who's more eloquent. So whenever I give one of you something that belongs to his brother, I am giving him a piece of hot coal from the hellfire. Let him take it or leave it. That's a, it's a strong, beautiful hadith. Yeah. So. Are we talking about the oath of the end? No, just, just the oath in general. Yeah. yeah, so if you come and say this, uh, this uh, mule is mine, uh, and this person took it from me, and, but it is mine, I will tell you where is your proof. You will say, I don't have proof. Then you have the right to say to the person who has the mule, take an oath, that this mule is yours, and that's it. You would walk away with it. You have it. So he couldn't produce a proof. Take an oath and walk away with your mule. If he refused to take the oath, we will give the mule to the claimant. Okay, so that's an oath. So the idea here is, uh, it, yes, we judge based on preponderance. 
uh, it is not certainty. And when we come back to talk about ta'arud al-bayyinat, when conflicting proofs, then we will talk more about this. But what I wanted to say is that the fuqaha that said that we don't only rely on bayinat that are traceable to the revelation, they were visionary and they were thinking way ahead. Uh, that we don't rely on only on uh, or we don't rely only on the bayina that is traceable to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Who are they? So Ibn Al-Qayyim Ibn Taymiyyah and certainly you would uh, see some awkwardness here because I would usually put Ibn Taymiyyah before Ibn al-Qayyim, the teacher before the student, but Ibn al-Qayyim uh, defended it more and he you know, has uh, basically more regard for corroborative evidence, tangible evidence uh, in his book of Turaq al-Hukmiyyah, widened the scope, defended it more. Uh, you have Ibn Farhun. Uh, he's a Maliki. You have Ibn al-Ghars, who is a Hanafi. Uh, you have many others. However, these are the main figures that talked about these issues in detail and defended the use of tangible evidence, corroborative evidence, qara'in, zawahir, uh, that we can say nowadays they would be defending forensic science, the use of forensic science in the judiciary. Okay, so qara'in are then to be used. As Muslims, we want to be careful in the employment of qara'in, but at the end of the day, justice is what we are seeking. And if we don't have bayinat, then we should employ uh, the qara'in. Okay. Uh, then, the Sheikh talks now about another issue, and then after this, uh, we should not forget to talk about uh, the gestaltish sort of uh, bringing it all together, uh, look at the issue of conflicting uh, evidences in the court. By the way, evidence is not a count word in most usage. But in ecclesiastical and legal usage, evidence is a count word. You could say evidences. Uh, okay. Biha. If a Muslim and unbeliever dispute over a deceased person, each one claiming that the person died on his faith, uh, if his original religion is known, then that will be his religion. People know, you know. If his original religion is unknown, then the inheritance will belong to the Muslim. And likewise, if they both have proof of their claims, then his, his uh, inheritance will belong to the Muslim. However, if only one of them has proof, a judgment will be made in his favor. Of course, you know, when someone has uh, a proof on anything, then the judgment will be made in favor of the person who has the proof. What if they don't have a proof? Do we know the original religion of the person? No, we don't. So two children here, or two relatives, it doesn't have to be two children, two relatives. You're claiming that the deceased person uh, died as a Muslim. You are a Muslim relative, claiming that the deceased person died as a Muslim. You are a non-Muslim relative, claiming that the deceased person died as non-Muslim. 
why are we why are they making the, these claims because his inheritance would go to his co-religionist his inheritance would go to his co-religionist now if if the if the original if the person's religion is unknown and no one has proof then the the weaker position in the madhab is what Ibn Qudama uh, rahimahullah says here. So Imam Ibn Qudama here is citing the weaker position in the madhab. And when we say this, who are we to say that Ibn Qudama does not know, you know, would cite the weaker position? No, it's just, this is a, a technical statement. This is not telling you about the truth, the ultimate truth, the truth in and of itself. And you have to grow up and just understand this. When people talk, they're not telling you the ultimate truth. Who knows the ultimate truth? You know, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows the ultimate truth. Uh, maybe Imam Ahmad himself would, would have, you know, some, one time said this or one time said that. You know, because yes, Imam Ahmad changed his mind. And that sometimes is based on uh, basically in, uh, added knowledge. And so, but sometimes it's based on him being a human being. Human beings get confused, yes, and human beings make errors and forget and all of that stuff. So, so no one is telling you the ultimate truth here. But when we say that this is the author, not the authorized view, we're saying it's not the authorized view based on a technical definition by the latter generations. So the latter generations say that the authorized view is going to be whatever it is that Al Iqna and Al Muntaha agree on. Two books in the Hanbali Madhab uh, that were written, uh, you know. Uh, by, by the you know in the latter uh, generations, and based on these uh, the agreement of these two books, usually if they agree, we take their agreement as the authorized position. So we're saying here he's citing the weaker position because they chose the latter generations chose the opposite position. They said uh, if the Muslim. Uh, if, if the Muslim and the non-Muslim children of the deceased fight over their religion, we will give it all to the non-Muslim. Why? Because, because if we will give it all to the non-Muslim, in which case? We will give it all to the non-Muslim if there is proof that the non-Muslim child is actually the child of the deceased and the brother of the, the other claimant. Either proof or acknowledgement. If the Muslim acknowledges the brotherhood of the non-Muslim, or there is proof, then it will, the, the, the whole inheritance will go to the non-Muslim. Why? Because they say that a Muslim parent will not basically sit qu quiet about his child apostatizing. You know, it would, he would have made, it would have been in the news. <laughs> so, uh, if, if, uh, if, huh? This is the weaker position. No. The weaker position is, the weaker position is what Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah, is citing here. He's saying we will give it to the Muslim because of Asl al-Islam, you know, and in a Muslim country, the default is that he is Muslim. In a, you know, in a Muslim uh, polity, the default is that he's Muslim. So by default, we would give it to the Muslim. And the default in general in human beings, that's what we Muslims say, that the default, the original state is Islam. You know, every child will be born on the fitra, the natural disposition, accepting one God only, and believing in one God only. So, uh, so that's why this is the, that's the weaker position that Imam Ibn Qudama is citing here. But the stronger position in the family in the, in the Madhab is that, you know, had this, uh, if we are sure now that this non-Muslim child is the brother of the other claimant and the son of the deceased, then we will give it all to the non-Muslim, because a Muslim parent would have made a big commotion if his child apostatized. But that's anyway, the, in their times it was a little different. They would not be particularly embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. Is it not that 
but 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 the other thing that he says, and likewise, if they if they both have proof of their claims, he said to give it to the to the to the Muslim. If they both have proofs, I have proof. I have proof. If they both have proofs, give it to the Muslim. In the authorized view in the Madhab, split it between them. Not, don't give it to the Muslim all. Split it between them if they both have proofs. Yes. Yes, well that is why that is why each one of them is trying to claim that the person died on their faith so that they are entitled to the inheritance. But since we are unable to figure this out, we are unable to figure out you know the religion that the person died on, then we're we're asking for proof. And if they have proofs, then we will split, according to the authorized position in the Madhab, we will split the inheritance between them. But we are unable to prove that the, 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 the religion of the father. That's the whole issue. If we are able to prove the religion of the father, it would be clear cut. If he was Muslim, his Muslim child will take the inheritance. If he was non-Muslim, his non-Muslim child will take his inheritance. If we're unable to figure it out, what do we do? Be, uh... Yeah, if each one of them has a bayina, we will split it between them. If they have no bayina, then they disagree in the madhab. So one people say the default is Islam. One people say if he were really Muslim, he would have not sit quiet about the apostasy of his child, and it would have been no. Uh, okay, so we've gone through uh, the chapter on conflicting uh, claims, and now it's time to put it all together, because last time we talked about al bayinat uh, Let's just try to put it all together so that we have this gestaltish view of uh, the whole issue. And maybe gestaltus is not the, the right word because it, there would be a little bit more detail than just a gestaltus view. But anyway, uh, we will say, uh, you know, two people are now coming. Uh, what is the strongest evidence to employ? Or what is uh, basically the, you know, in, in, in line of all the evidences that we talked about, what, what would be the one to be given precedence? Iqrar or bayina? They disagree. If the iqrar, and if we have iqrar or bayina, they disagree whether we judge by the iqrar, which is acknowledgement, confession, or the bayina. And why would they disagree? Why would they say al-Hutraf say the adilla? They say confession is the best, the greatest of all evidences. But they say al-Iqrar hujjatun qasira. They say, you know, in the legal maxims, they say al-Iqrar is a deficient evidence. Why is it deficient? Qasira means deficient. Why is al-Iqrar deficient? Al-Iqrar is deficient because al-Muqir, the, the, uh, the person who makes the acknowledgement, is the only one bound by this iqrar. Other people are not bound by my acknowledgement. So if people dispute over a property and I acknowledge your ownership of this property, other people are not bound by that acknowledgement. But al bayina the proof is hujja muta'addiya, is basically, um, what, transitive evidence, meaning it will cross, it, it will apply to everybody. We have established the bayina proof now. Uh, it is not just mere iqrar or confession of one disputant, of one disputant. So, but, aside from al iqrar being hujja qasira, from being, from being intransitive proof, uh, deficient, limited to the muqir, the one makes, uh, making the acknowledgement, iqrar uh, should come on top because it ends everything right there. 
the prayer should come on top. Does it end everything right there? Controversial, because some people would say, no, let's just listen to the Bayina also, so we judge according to the Bayina, so that you know the judgment is transitive, not intransitive, muta'addiyah, not qasira. But anyway, acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. Bayina would come right here. Bayina would be proof, evidence, would come right here. And we talked about a bayonet for witnesses, two witnesses, in all cases aside from four witnesses are needed with sexual crimes. Uh, one male plus two female witnesses. One male plus the oath. Anything else? Refusal to take an oath. Would you, uh, would you say that this is a bayana or you, would you add it uh, here? Uh, you would say it is a bayana because it is proven that the Prophet ﷺ acted on uh, this refusal to take an oath. Uh, he said, Shahidaka aw yaminuhu laysa laka illa zalik. He said, you produce your two witnesses or he takes an oath, you're entitled to none but that. And this was reported by al-Bukhari. Shahidak aw yaminuhu laysa laka illa zalik. Your two witnesses or his oath. When you claim that something in the position of another person is actually yours and not his, produce your evidence your two witnesses, or his oath, you're entitled to nothing other than this. The Hanafis will take this, and certainly would like to take this, and say, look, you guys are saying otherwise. You guys are saying one witness and, and his oath. But the Prophet is saying, your two witnesses, or his oath, you're entitled to nothing other than this. Then the Jumhur will say, but they will cite the other hadith where the Prophet ﷺ judged by one witness and an oath. And sometimes if, you know, we don't know the context and we don't know all the details, but we're trying to figure out to the best of our ability the intent of the legislator. Why did the Prophet judge, why, why did he say shahidaka wa and he did not offer him one, he could have said to him, bring me one shahid and take an oath, or he will take an oath. Uh, he did not say that. So it is, it is not always clear cut, although some people would like to see everything as clear cut. And if you have exposure to the evidences of your madhab only, then you will end up being somewhat dogmatic because you will see things as uh, what, b black and white. Okay, so the bayina. Uh, so we said the akrar, we said the bayina, and then we should put al zahir here. Al zahir. Uh, we should put al zahir here. Now, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, are we giving the oaths? to the person before we employ a zahir? No. We're employing the zahir, the qarina, the corroborative evidence, before giving the oath to the defendant. Therefore, refusal to take an oath, even though it is a bayina, the Prophet ﷺ said it is a bayina, but this is not basically the real bayina. So we're having it here. And nukul is after a zahir. In Nikul, refusal to take an oath is after a zahir. And then we have al qura in Nikul, which is refusal to take an oath. Al zahir, which is that which is apparent, or al qarina, which is corroborative evidence, tangible proof. Okay, in Nukur, refusal to take an oath. And then we have Al-Qur'a, which is drawing lots. Uh, 
And then we have a yameen only. Sometimes we said it would be the yameen. Uh, to, and, and keep in mind, I want to, you to pay attention to this. Whenever we judge by anything short of, short of bayina, short of bayina, we need the amin as well. We need the amin as well. So if we judge by a zahir, before we give it to, to one of them, we tell him, take, take an oath. If we judge by, when we judge by the nukul, you know, someone refused to take an oath, the defender refused to take an oath, I told you that the position I believe in, which is the weaker position in the madhab, is that the oath goes back to the claimant. The stronger position in the madhab is that the oath does not go back to the claimant. Of course, the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ gave the oath back to the claimant is weak. So we're not, but it, it makes perfect sense. It's just this, because if you are going to walk away with it, take an oath, you know. Uh, so, uh, so then, and the qura also, when, when they draw lots, it's not that they're gonna draw lots and that will decide, there will be an oath as well. So if, if, your, if your lot comes out, you're not gonna walk away with it, just, just because your lot came out. You will take the oath then. You will be entitled to taking the oath then. The, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu and it is reported by Al-Bukhari as well and Muslim, uh, th that the Prophet Sallallahu he ordered people to take an oath, فَأَسْرَعُوا fi. So they all rushed to take the oath. فَأَمَرَ أَنْ يُسْحَمَ بَيْنَهُمْ so the Prophet ﷺ commanded that they draw lots to determine who takes the oath first. Okay, so these are all different ways, but you will find the burning desire for justice quite clear here. We're trying to get to the bottom of it, and we're employing everything possible. The idea of the Qur'a drawing lots, this may sound ridiculous to you, but when, when at the end of the day, we have nothing to go by, nothing to go by. So should we give it to the guy who's taller or shorter or uh, fatter or slimmer? Uh, well, draw lots. We have nothing to go by, draw lots. Uh, so uh, about the Yameen, whenever we're judging by anything short of Bayina, there will be an addition to this I mean, Take the oath. And taking the oath, you know, مَنْ حَلَفَ عَلَى يَمِينٍ يَبْتَطْعُ بِهَا شَيْئًا مِنْ حَقِّ يَقِيهِ وَهُوَ فِيهَا فَاجِرٍ أَدْخَلَهُ اللَّهُ النَّارَ وَحَرَّمَ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ So whoever takes an oath, the Prophet وسلم, whoever takes an oath to take something from his brother, وَهُوَ فِيهَا فَاجِرٍ While he is treacherous or lying about it, Allah will uh, make paradise forbidden for him and will uh, uh, enter him into the hellfire. So the idea of, you know, shahada al-zur, qawl al-zur, there is like a genre of a hadith about the, the you know, shahada al-zur, false testimony, genre of a hadith about qawl al-zur, false statement, about the yameen in particular, taking an oath in particular in which you are lying uh, to take, you know, something, some of the rights of your brother. So the judges used to remind people of those ahadith, remind people of the gravity. And sometimes, and we have this recorded, people did walk away and refused to take the oath after it was right there. They could have taken the property just by an oath. And when they were reminded, they, they walked away and did not take the oath. So anyway, uh, one of the things that we talked about the Iqrar and Bayina and putting the Iqrar against the Bayina and we said that Iqrar is Hujja Qasara, intransitive uh, or de deficient. It will apply only to the Muqarr, the person making the acknowledgement. Uh, 
And uh, if there is a bayina, I would say, let us also listen to the bayina. If someone make their confession or acknowledgement, let's also listen to the bayina so that we have judged for the claimant not only on the basis of iqrar, but also on the basis of bayina so that the, he has this power. Uh, not only against the muqar, or the person who's making the acknowledgement, but against anyone else. Then, one of the things that are to be discussed here is now, Uh, one of the things that, that we want to discuss here is, are all bayinat equal? Are all bayinat equal? So, one person brought a bayina. One person, okay, so one person brought 300 witnesses. One person brought 7 witnesses. One person brought 2 witnesses. One person brought 1 witness and his oath. One witness and his oath. One person brought one male witness, two female witnesses. Are they all equal? No. Should we move from here to here? Uh, because each one of them has a bayina. So the person who brought 300 witnesses and the person who brought one witness and was willing to take his oath are going to be equal. Okay, so by default, in the Hanbali Mazhab, all equal. Why? Because this is a bayana, this is a bayana. The pro Prophet considered this a bayana, the Prophet considered this a bayana. So he established what is considered admissible proof. So he established his right to the property or to his claim by an admissible proof. I don't care if you brought if your seven witnesses are Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Nasai and Ibn Majah, you know, and Imam Ahmad, uh, and your one witness is whatever, uh, I don't care. Uh, so that's, that's the prevalent position in the Madhab. But let us try to talk about this in some uh, detail because it's important. What, one thing that they would all agree on, uh, and I'm presuming the Hanbalis would also agree on this, is Tawatur. So the 300 witnesses coming from different parts of town and from different backgrounds and not related to each other, have never seen each other, this establishes what we call what? Tawatur. And this Tawatur establishes Yaqeen or Dhan. Certainty or, or preponderance, yaqeed. And just like in riwayah, and they employ the rules of riwayah a lot, and the defense will also say shahada is not like riwayah. And the, you know, whoever is invoking the rules of riwayah uh, will always say shahada is somewhat like riwayah. In this particular regard, it should be like riwayah or treated like riwayah. The defense will say, no, shahada is not like riwayah. But anyway, in riwayah, do we give, uh, that's also sometimes controversial in riwayah. Like you have a hadith that is reported by seven people and a hadith that is reported by one. But if the trustworthy, and they are trustworthy, then they will disagree over you know, if they conflict, they'll disagree over we should give preference to the one that is reported by seven or, or three or two or four versus the one who is. Hmm. How about the hadith that Imam Bukhari brings that he said that uh, the man was walking by the masjid and he saw when the Muslims used to pray facing Jerusalem and the man yelled into the masjid while they went in Ruku. 
and said that he sweared by Allah, that he saw the Prophet, that he prayed with the Prophet and the Prophet was praying Fajr facing Mecca and all of the people turned. There's one man. But this is a riwaya. This is not a, this is this is basically not a disputation. This is not something this is not about disputation. This is about a report, Khabar al Wahad al Thiqa. This is the report of a one trustworthy person. And we act on this. We, uh, hadith are mostly akhbar uh, ahad, or singular reports. But the idea here is, uh, in, in a nutshell, because this, is a, this will take several uh, sessions, several days, to talk about tarjih bin al-bayinat, which is favoring some of the bayinat over others. Um, very quickly, there is, there is this agreement. You will find that uh, the majority will give, you know, you'll find that the majority will tend to hold the bayonet equal, except in a few cases. Let us remove Tawatur out of the picture because Tawatur establishes certainty. We're removing this out of the picture, but let us talk about uh, 300 witnesses from different backgrounds, and it would have been impossible for them to collude on falsehood. Uh, but let us talk about, you know, seven witnesses versus two. That is tarjih bil adad. That is favoring based on numbers. Uh, so what would the majority say here? Seven witnesses is like two. Um, and and uh, keep in mind, we don't have something clearly established from the Prophet Therefore, therefore, it is basically, uh, you know, when there is room, then we will do that which is more uh, closer to the intent of the legislator and more suitable for our circumstances, more suitable for the times. There is no clear cut evidence from the Prophet we, we talked before, last time we talked about when two people have a bayina or they don't have a bayina, like something that is not possessed by any one of them. And the, the, each one of them has a bayina. Or none of them have a bayina. And we said that in the Hanbali Mazhab, we, we go to Qura, uh, drone lots, okay? And then why do we draw lots? To determine who will take the oath. And the person who will take the oath will do what? Take it all for himself. Okay? Well, in the, in the, in the Hanafi Mazhab, which is something I would actually favor, and this is another report in the Hanbali Mazhab, and that's the beauty of the Hanbali Mazhab. You'll always find some report uh, that, that, you know, some variant report. So another report in the Hanbali Mazhab is that uh, particularly when they, when they both have a bayina, when they both have a bayina. The other report in the Hanbali Madhab, which is the Hanafi position, is that after, if they both have a bayina, we will split it between them. Each one of them will take an oath and we will split it between them. Not that in the authorized report in the Hanbali Madhab, they will take all of it. The first one who draws the lot will take all of it and walk away. There are no two reports in the Hanbali Madhab about the lack of bayina. They will say, draw lots, take an oath, walk away with it. But when both have a bayina, they will say, split it. Each one will take an oath, but split it. And that is uh, the, the Hanafi position. But if they both do not have a bayina, the Hanafis and some Shafis as well said, split it also. Split it also between them because they both don't have a bayina. Is it closer to, just, to justice that we let them draw lots 
and whoever, whosoever's lot comes out, takes an oath and takes it all for himself, or closer to justice, to just split it. Each one will take an oath. And if they both took the oath, we'll split it. So here, uh, you have reports from the Prophet that uh, or you have different reports from the Prophet that two men disputed over a, uh, a beast of burden and the Prophet commanded them to draw lots. Okay, you have another report that the Prophet split it between them split the dab between them, the value, she, it will be sold, and then they will split the value. Uh, you, have a, you have more cha chain-wise, chain-wise, the chains are on the Hanbali side, uh, to, st to some extent, uh, to, that drawn lots will be, will be superior. But Abu Darda, Abu Darda's judgment uh, corroborates the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have split it between them. Have split it between them. So you will have basically the the the, the textual proofs are to some extent conflicting and unclear and undecisive. But then in this case, you employ the principles, the fiqh principles, and whatever is closer to justice, you, you would go by it. Whether you believe it is drawn lots, or splitting it, drawing lots and giving one of them the, the whole thing, if his lot came out, or splitting it between them and taking an oath for each one of them. So there is all, there is this room, and you have to use the rigidity. Will make the the problem with rigidity that makes me go back and keep on going back to this. I will not uh, basically grow weary of warning against rigidity. Is that it makes the Sharia just unsustainable, inapplicable. Uh, and this is a crime against the Sharia. Uh, but anyway, so Bayina here, if I believe that Bayinat should not be all treated equally, the authorized position in the Hanbali Mazhab, Bayinat are all treated equally. You bring one man, two women. You bring two men. You bring seven men. You bring. Uh, one man and your oath, even that, all should be treated equally. So you, your bayina, one man and your oath. His bayina, seven trustworthy men of the top tier, Bukhari and Muslim, and they're coming for to testify. Or al Khulafa al Arba, you know, are coming to testify. Uh, doesn't matter. So, التَّرْجِيحِ بِالْعَدَدِ Favoring by numbers. Hanbalis would say no. The other position would say yes. Favoring by adala, trustworthiness. Hanbalis in the authorized view, no. But Hanbalis also in the other view, and many others, will say yes. Tarjih or favoring by the type of bayina. Will I favor two Male witnesses over one male witness and two female witnesses. Controversial. I don't. I, I honestly, and it's not. It's not modernist or anything. I. I, I think that, it, that you know, two male witnesses should not be stronger than one male and two females. Uh, but I truly believe, and this is the position of the majority, that two male witnesses should be superior to one made witness and your oath. We're giving you the oath as an exceptional condition. We said that the Prophet in Bukhari said to the man, Shahidaka aw yaminuhu, laysa laka illa dhalik. Your two witnesses or his oath, you are entitled to nothing other than this. The fact that the Prophet sometimes judged by one 
witness and the oath, we don't know the exact context. This may have been an exceptional case. Yes, we will employ it. I side with the majority. We, we will employ it. We will employ it basically when we don't have anything better to go by. But if someone is bringing you like six witnesses, and someone is bringing you one witness and their oath, to me it is straightforward. I, you know, one bayana here is stronger than the other. And before we move to other uh, preponderators, we will favor one bayana over another. Okay. Uh, is it sort of getting clearer? You know, Iqrar, first thing, this is the master of all evidences, but it is a master of all evidences against the muqir, the person making the acknowledgement, not other people. Bayina and Bayina. Uh, not all bayanat create, were created equal. Bayanat vary among themselves. Some bayanat are stronger than others. Karina, corroborative evidence, we are seeing how they judged by corroborative evidence. We're, we're seeing how they judged by Zawaha. Therefore, the incorporation of tangible proofs or, uh, in the Islamic judiciary is warranted. Forensic science uh, is important for the Islamic judiciary. We're saying that in Nukul, refusal to take an oath, I believe that if someone, if we, if, if it would come down to take an oath and the defendant refused to take the oath, I believe it should go back to the claimant and then he would walk away. I believe that certainly Qur'a is, a, is an excellent way of figuring things out when we don't have any other thing to go by. Uh, and it is a pure justice. And any time we're judging by anything short of a bayina, the person that we are judging in their favor will not walk away without taking an oath. If he's going to walk away with this property, with this mule, with this anything, he will take an oath first before he walks away. And that brings us to the end of this chapter on conflicting evidences. Uh, and the next one, inshallah, which we will go over in seven minutes, will be Bab Hukm Kitab al Qadi, or the chapter on correspondence of judges. <laughs> وأتوب إليه.